There's something haunting about worlds that have been abandoned. Yet, when I look at a forgotten place, I feel a certain allure that is hard to explain. You've probably seen landscapes similar to these and felt a mix of curiosity and fascination with the unknown and unseen. And we can find this kind of eerie beauty everywhere. In literature, movies, and even in games where developers create suspenseful and open environments for storytelling. There's just something about exploring worlds that have been lost that ignites a natural human curiosity about their past. But how am I supposed to feel when I see a ghost town or forgotten amusement park? Am I supposed to feel sorrow for what's been lost? Should I be unsettled by the silence and emptiness? Or should I stand in awe of a past magnificence and the life that once filled these places? because it is in the quiet of these forgotten worlds that their secrets come alive. Perhaps for the last time. One could argue that modern architecture's primary purpose is to create safe, warm boxes for people to live and work in. And while architects in our era have provided us with buildings that are efficient and clean, they often feel emotionally dead. On the other hand, a crumbling castle offers little protection from the elements, yet its long process of decay imbues it with a unique aesthetic as it gradually rejoins the earth. The German word Runenlust stands for, well, as you can probably guess, an appreciation for ruins. It describes the complex feeling of wonder you get when wandering through the remnants of the past. One place that made me feel a sense of ruin and lust was when I looked at pictures of the Cape Romano Dome, a unique vacation retreat built in the early 1980s with six interconnected domes. What started as a luxurious getaway, complete with solar panels and rainwater collection, slowly fell victim to the relentless forces of nature, leaving the house stranded in the Gulf of Mexico until they eventually succumbed to nature's forces entirely. But the phenomenon of Rune and Lust extends beyond our reality. In the video game Horizon Zero Dawn, the ruins of the Old Ones provide a curious example of the contrast between decaying structures and nature's resurgence. These Old Ones refer to the humans of our modern civilization, the ones who existed before the catastrophic event that threw the world of Horizon into this post-apocalyptic state. Within minutes of exploring the landscape, the reason for civilization's collapse becomes clear. Ruins are littered with remnants of ancient technology and machines have entirely replaced the natural ecosystem. But even more chilling is the sight that haunts the horizon. A colossal machine, its metal tentacles gripping the mountain like the claws of some forgotten god. How could humanity ever hope to stand against such a gargantuan creation? It's for this reason the old ones left behind a mixed legacy. On one hand, they are admired for their innovative capabilities, but on the other hand, they are also seen as a cautionary tale for the dangers of unchecked technological advancement. Okay, before we continue, I have a confession to make. As one of the old ones, which I guess we all are in a way, I need to admit something a little embarrassing. It took me like two whole playthroughs of Horizon to realize something that might be obvious. Those ruins scattered all over the place? They're not just random piles of rocks. They're based on actual, real-life buildings. For example, I must have walked past this wreckage at least a dozen times before I recognized it as the St. Mary's Cathedral in Colorado. Which is strange, isn't it? How the familiar can become so unrecognizable. How something so grand could one day be reduced to... this. Horizon is packed with similar crumbling monuments. The Denver Stadium is now this colossal ruin, completely swallowed by nature. Even Red Rock's amphitheater, the iconic venue carved into the mountainside, is lost to the elements. The mountain has reclaimed the stage where legends once performed. It's pretty mind-blowing that the developers didn't just create a generic post-apocalyptic world. They took our world our landmarks, and reimagined them as these haunting echoes of the past. There's a whole list of these in-game places and it's incredible to see. You can look up the real-life location, then jump into the game and explore its virtual counterpart. You get to witness firsthand the power of nature, the fragility of civilization, and maybe even catch a glimpse of what our own future might hold. 
The cyclical nature of existence suggests that even after a devastating event, humanity's innate ability to adapt and innovate will lead to a new era of civilization. Because while it's easy to imagine the remnants of a once thriving world as the end, very often it's just an intermission. Earth has witnessed this drama play out not once, not twice, but five times. Five mass extinctions, each a brutal curtain call, sweeping away entire casts of life. But the stage was never empty for long. From the Permian-Triassic Great Dying, the most catastrophic extinction event our planet has ever faced, emerged the dinosaurs. A diverse crew of toothy, clawed and feathered wonders. Without that fiery apocalypse, we'd never have seen the likes of the nimble Microraptor or the earth-shaking Giraffe Titan. And when the dinosaurs' reign met its own dramatic end, it wasn't curtains for life itself. Instead, their exit opened the door for our furry ancestors, the mammals, to take center stage. Earth could easily have become an abandoned wasteland after enduring so many mass extinctions. It's no surprise then that, while it may sound like a cheesy movie line, it's the stone-cold truth of our planet. Life finds a way. If I had to choose a game that truly embodies this concept, it would have to be Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. Because there's a fascinating paradox about the Legend of Zelda franchise. Games that are beloved for its heroism and adventure, that is built upon a foundation of divine tragedy. A curse that binds the fate of the realm to an endless cycle of suffering, with the world being destroyed and rebuilt every 100 years. The cataclysmic event known as the Upheaval caused Hyrule Castle to float and led to the formation of caves and chasms. It completely rearranged the terrain. Familiar landscapes are now riddled with gaping ravines, mysterious ruins and all sorts of weird phenomena. So when you think about it, Hyrule's endless cycle of destruction is undeniably grim. But on the bright side, the whole apocalypse thing leaves us with a massive playground to uncover in every new Zelda game. And most of the time in Tears of the Kingdom, the only way to interact with these new locations is the new fuse mechanic that lets you merge basically anything in the environment with another object. It's this new tool that makes me impressed that other players manage to actually beat the game. Because there's just so much to do. I always get sidetracked creating bizarre apparatuses and unconventional vehicles, which are, by the way, still super important for getting around this massive open world. Maybe my engineering skills could use some work though. But there was something foreboding about going back to an already explored Hyrule in Tears of the Kingdom. Before the release of the game, trailers showed an additional layer above Hyrule Kingdom. The Sky Islands, a realm of floating islands with golden trees and ancient stonework now rests in the clouds. But what the trailers kept hidden was another realm, even more vast than the Sky Islands. Hyrule practically begs you to climb and explore every nook and cranny. But then you stumble upon this sludge-covered hole with injured people desperately warning you to stay away. It couldn't be less inviting. So, of course, I jumped in. And my jaw basically hit the floor when I reached the bottom. I stumbled into a massive, unexplored ecosystem hidden beneath the surface of Hyrule. The air here is damp and decaying, teeming with otherworldly flora. Navigating this hidden abyss reveals that the creatures roaming here offer little hospitality to outsiders. So I quickly had to start building new, not so unconventional vehicles to help me explore this intriguing region. When I see photos of abandoned places, I can't help but think the photographer must have experienced a similar rush of excitement and wonder that I felt discovering the depths in Tears of the Kingdom. That thrill of stumbling upon hidden corners and forgotten stories. Perhaps it's not surprising then that urban exploring, or urbex, is becoming increasingly popular in recent years. The decline of industries and the resulting abandonment of buildings are creating new opportunities for exploration. However, it doesn't come without risks. These decaying structures, often riddled with hazards like unstable floors, exposed wiring and sharp debris, can pose serious risks to those who venture within. But despite this, the allure of the unknown and the desire to find beauty in the natural cycle of growth, decay and death remain strong. 
There's a Japanese philosophy and aesthetic that is based on this concept. It's called Wabi Sabi and it teaches us to find beauty in the imperfections and impermanence of life and to embrace the natural flow of time and change. The relentless forces of nature will inevitably reclaim what was once ours. Walls crumble and fade, roots force their way through concrete, and life blossoms amidst the remnants of human endeavors. It's by looking at a forgotten cruise ship or an overgrown jungle temple where we can see that beauty isn't about being flawless, but about authenticity. They're places where time has woven its narrative, where beauty resides in the rust, the cracks, and the inevitable march of nature. Time doesn't stand still here, it just follows a different rhythm. If there's one game that proves that random plants and industrial mass can be more beautiful than perfectly planned cityscapes, it's Cloud Gardens. This is a relaxing, post-apocalyptic game about using plants to overgrow abandoned wasteland dioramas. I know, that's quite the description for a game. By collecting seeds, you can cultivate small, verdant exhibits by strategically arranging discarded objects like traffic cones, tires, and street signs. And the results are an oddly beautiful contrast between the manufactured and the natural. Playing this makes me think I should confess one of my guilty pleasures. It's like the complete opposite of what this channel usually focuses on. But I've sunk thousands of hours into cozy games like Animal Crossing and Stardew Valley. I guess after spending so much time delving into the cosmic horror of Lovecraft, there's just something oddly appealing about being able to escape to your own little island paradise. It's hard to put into words, but these games offer a comforting break from the real world. A place where you can just relax and go for a dive. And Cloud Gardens makes me feel this way too, but it's complicated. Because I can design a beautiful paradise for my Animal Crossing villagers, or plan the perfect farm layout in Stardew Valley. But I can't do that in Cloud Gardens. I have to accept that nature will take its course, and a single seed has the potential to birth new worlds. Sometimes, one small sign of life is all it takes to bring a lost world back to life. There are towering trash heaps as a monument to humanity's past excesses in the 2008 movie WALL-E. The planet became so toxic that Earth was rendered uninhabitable, forcing humanity to abandon their homes and seek refuge on massive spaceships. The only remnants of their presence are the tireless WALL-E units, diligently cleaning up the mess in the hopes that one day humanity might return to a revitalized planet. At its heart, WALL-E explores the devastating impact of unchecked consumerism and environmental disregard, depicting Earth as a desolate wasteland. Humans, lost in their technologically driven complacency, seem to have completely forgotten their roots. All that's left is a little robot that finds solace in his collection of trinkets to create order within the chaos. A Rubik's Cube, a Spork, a light bulb. Small pieces to keep the memory of a lost world alive. Sometimes the best way to understand a world long forgotten is through the eyes of an outsider. In the game Stray, you embody a curious cat, separated from its family and plunged into a decaying cyber city. This forgotten world is inhabited by robots and plagued by dangerous creatures that threaten them. Early in your exploration, you encounter a friendly robot that is like a universal translator, turning the beeps and boops from inhabitants into purrs and meows for the cat, I suppose. This artificial intelligence named B12 has a grand purpose beyond just translation. While you, the cat, long to reunite with your family, B12 yearns to liberate everyone trapped within the city. Though you control the cat, the heart of Stray's story lies with B12. The feline friend acts as more of a vessel for B12's journey, helping this AI uncover the mysteries of the past and find a way to escape. You are there to explore, to navigate the city and interact with the inhabitants through the robot. But the cat itself is a blank canvas, nameless and defined more by its circumstances than any distinct personality. In this way, as we explore abandoned places, we are that cat. We don't know the story because it isn't ours. In the silence of empty rooms, we can hear the heartbeat of history as a rhythm that connects us to those who walked these paths before. 
In Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, you explore an English countryside in 1984. You arrive in a village only to find it completely deserted. As you explore, you piece together the events leading up to the disappearance of the villagers through environmental storytelling and ghostly apparitions representing the memories of the former residents. Exploring abandoned homes, churches and shops reveals remnants of everyday life frozen in time. At the heart of the mystery is a strange phenomenon called the Pattern, an otherworldly light that interacts with the villagers and seems to hold the key to their vanishing. How you engage with the game is influenced by your perspective and expectations. Because for some, it's a pleasant walk through picturesque landscapes, a chance to savor the beauty of a virtual England. For others, it's a terrifying peek into the Lovecraftian themes of cosmic dread and forbidden knowledge. The apparitions show how the villagers become increasingly obsessed with the pattern, and many of them start to leave their homes and wander out into the fields to gaze at it. Until eventually, the light responds. I think part of my fascination with Forgotten Realms isn't from the physical runes themselves, but from the stories and echoes of the past that they hold. Boslotza, a colossal communist monument in Bulgaria, stands abandoned atop a mountain. Once a symbol of power, its decaying concrete and faded mosaics are now a melancholic beauty. The looted copper roof and graffitied walls narrate a story of political change and the relentless passage of time. In every corner of the globe, there are places where time stands still, and we've witnessed this allure in both real-life ruins and the virtual landscapes of video games. Yet these same abandoned spaces can quickly turn ominous. Dim lighting and flickering lanterns create a sense of foreboding, leaving us with the chilling anticipation of something lurking just beyond our sight. That's why abandoned places serve as a quintessential setting for horror games. They play on that classic haunted house trope. You know, the one where the real shocker is that the abandoned place isn't actually abandoned. Few games capture the essence of this setting better than the unnerving game No One Lives Under the Lighthouse. The game follows a lighthouse keeper on a desolate island, tasked with keeping the light bright and shining for passing ships at night. The game's title might be a little on the nose, but at least your task here is straightforward. Climb the winding staircase, turn the crank to rotate the light, and apply oil to ensure it keeps shining until morning. On this tiny lonely island, the sky is a constant shroud of grey. The only sounds are the wind and the calls of seagulls. The dreary weight of loneliness presses down constantly, leaving no doubt you've been left to your solitary task maintaining the lighthouse beacon against the darkness, night after night. But it doesn't take long for strange things to start happening. You wake up to find a puddle of black liquid next to your bed. Digging into dirt uncovers the buried corpses of dead seagulls. And then, one night, after igniting the lighthouse beacon, you notice something moving beneath you. It's difficult to identify what it is until you look up and see thousands of moths swarming the tower. Not long after, there's a scene of a hidden monster waking up at the dock, confirming that this island is, in fact, not deserted. And then, one night while tending to the lighthouse, the perspective abruptly shifts. You're still controlling the lighthouse keeper, but you now see the world through the eyes of the pursuing creature until you make it to safety. I played the original version, not the director's cut, so I don't think it's a spoiler to say that the game gets ludicrous. You start by waking up on a shore, surrounded by the ruins of what seems to be some ancient civilization and weird bug-like statues. You find a chest that blasts a beam of light straight into the sky. It's fitting, I suppose, that the treasure is something moths crave above all else, because the monster haunting the island looks like this. Not much later, the perspective shifts once more, and you find yourself crawling along a wall as the creature, compelled by voices in your head to capture the lighthouse keeper and drag him to the fleshy tunnels under the lighthouse. And soon after, the ending arrives, because no one lives under the lighthouse is a brief experience, offering just a fleeting look into a much bigger world of terrors. The image of a lighthouse keeper, alone and gradually succumbing to insanity, is a familiar narrative often explored in stories and films. However, 
a more sinister culprit may have played a role in the mental health struggles of some lighthouse keepers. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, some lighthouses began using liquid mercury to float the heavy Fresnel lenses that focused the light. This allowed the lenses to rotate more smoothly, but mercury is a highly toxic heavy metal, and prolonged exposure can have devastating effects on the nervous system. Symptoms include loss of coordination, difficulty speaking and hearing, personality changes, and even hallucinations and delusions. While long stretches of solitude could certainly take a toll on anyone's mental well-being, mercury poisoning could also cause symptoms easily mistaken for mental illness, contributing to the perception of lighthouse keepers going mad. But the isolation of a lighthouse surrounded by the vastness of the sea is just one example of how abandoned places can fuel our fears. Nestled high in the Colorado Rockies, the Overlook Hotel from The Shining takes this concept to another level. Cut off from the world by a harsh winter, the Overlook embodies the chilling dread of abandonment. Its vast, empty halls echo with the whispers of past tragedies, while its maze-like corridors create a sense of claustrophobia and disorientation. The Overlook Hotel becomes a character in its own right, its isolation serving as a catalyst for the psychological breakdown of its caretaker, Jack Torrance. The hotel's emptiness becomes a canvas for his inner demons, and the vastness of the surrounding wilderness amplifies his feelings of helplessness and despair. Whether it's a solitary lighthouse battered by the waves or a grand hotel shrouded in snow, abandoned places tap into our primal fears of isolation, the unknown, and the potential for darkness lurking within ourselves. Because who among us is not ruined? When we see a crumbling building, it reminds us of our own flaws. We recognize the damage within ourselves and find solace in the shared experience of imperfection. A reminder that even in ruin, there is a strange and compelling beauty. And perhaps that's the most profound aspect of worlds that are forgotten. Their ability to make us think about the future. As we stand amidst the ruins of the past, we can't help but wonder what the future might hold for us. Will our own cities one day lie abandoned, reclaimed by nature? What will remain of our civilization, our achievements, our memories? It's a bit of a downer, but also a strangely motivating one. Rune and Lust shows us that nothing lasts forever. So why don't we live in the moment and make the most of our time? Because in the end, we're all just temporary inhabitants of this planet, leaving behind our own marks, our own stories, that may one day become the ruins of tomorrow. As always, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video about abandoned places, ruin and lust, or just nature reclaiming technology, don't forget to show your support by liking the video, subscribing, and hitting the bell notification icon. And I'll see you in the next video.